Today I thought I would read, um, today I thought I would read uh, two different essays um, and not give a long preamble beforehand, but kind of just dive into them. Um, they're beautiful essays, both of them. They're very different from each other. Um, and in that way, they're interesting. Um, and I'd like to talk about the process by which both of them were written after I read them. I'll just say a little bit that, uh, a little bit about them, so it's kind of by way of introduction. The first one um, is a kind of collage essay, and it's pieces put together. Um, and the second one has a main idea that's unpacked. Um, it reminds me of, uh, in chemistry, I think it's synthesis is the when you take two elements and you put it together like H and O and you have water. Um, and the other one I think is decomposition or combustion or something when you have an element in it and like water becomes then um, oxygen and hydrogen. So the first one is synthesis. It's like a collage that's woven together. And the second one is kind of an, an idea, main idea that's unpacked. The second one as well is the... Um, essay that I didn't read last time, um, which is about, has elements um, of, well, addresses questions of racism and gun violence and somewhat the connection between those two for this particular um, student who wrote it. Um, the first student uh, essay helped get uh, the student Andrew Stoddard into MIT and the second one, uh, Lauren Kahn uh, to UC Berkeley. So they're, they're beautiful essays, and um, I'll speak a little bit after I read them. Uh, I've never read two in one session, so I'm just going to get to it. Um, they're beautiful essays, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak about them after. So the first one by Andrew Stoddard, who is attending MIT. Brooke became the sister I never had before I knew I had one that I lost. Every night we set the clocks one and a half hours ahead to 8 p.m., exactly my twin brother's bedtime. Chase and Christian, bedtime, hollered Brooke, our au pair from New Zealand. Once the twins were in bed, Brooke and I settled down in front of the TV to watch Fringe. Despite having their own rooms, I still find my 12-year-old twin brothers, Chase and Christian, together in the same bed every morning when they wake up. They have the same friends, play the same video games, and both love reading. Their only difference is one looks three years older than the other. I sometimes wish they actually were three years apart. Their unique bond as twins leaves no room for me. At moments, I imagine them floating inside, sorry, at moments, I imagine them floating together inside my mom, underwater, with me standing outside on the shore. Hidden from me was that I did have a sister, but she died of a heart defect shortly after birth when I was three. Her name was Kate. It slipped out of my mom's mouth in front of my friend one day when I was 14. This made me angry. How had I never heard of her before? Why would my mom let me know in such a casual way? Hours later, the shock stabbed me. I imagined a different life a life in which I had my sister standing next to me on the shore. A few years later, <clears throat> at the Southwest Regional Rowing Championships, I dragged my arms in the water as my boat crossed the finish line, seven seconds ahead of our rival, Newport, soaking everyone in front of me. Jack Wool, a few seats ahead of me, threw up his arms in celebration. Minutes later, we approached the beach. Then, out of the blue, our coach dove head first into the water with all his clothes on to congratulate us. All eight of us followed suit and jumped out of the boat and into the water together. There we were, almost as if being baptized together, the crew, my crew, my adopted brothers. Even though I will never be able to get my sister back or squeeze between Chase and Christian who live their lives in sync, I have found others to sync up with. Every afternoon, I go to the boathouse and practice with seven other teammates. We row in unison. Our hands flow as one, our legs thrust as one, and we share the passion to win as one. We trust each other more than anyone else in the world. Just as Chase and Christian form their bond underwater inside my mom, I form my bond on the water with my crew. 
This challenge has made me stronger, giving me the faith and courage to know I can find and create a family wherever I go. It's a beautiful essay, I think. Um, it was written, again, where I asked the student to come up with five significant moments, and he thought of um, the, moments when, the moment when they won the championship and his team and his coach jumped into the water, the moment um, when the au pair, they set the clocks wrong so him and his au pair could hang out together and the twins could go to bed, um, the moment his mother slipped out and he, it was revealed to him that he had a sister, um, and um, just a description of the twins themselves and their being completely in sync and that he feels excluded. So he had these four or five moments and of course didn't know that they went together and in discussion we realized that they they actually were very connected. Um, and it took a lot of digging and a lot of soul searching and a lot of um, a lot of work to weave the threads together um, and what he came up with and and yes I, I mentioned the moment that his mother revealed that he had a sister is that he always felt outside of his twin brothers the sister would have given him he felt some sort of you know refuge or a companionship that he could not find with those brothers um, and that the there was this water theme that was running through it with um, being on crew and them jumping in the water like a baptism and imagining his brothers in utero having the same in sync experience that they had when they after they were born and through our discussions and a lot of work he came to see how it all worked together and when it finally came together it was just revelatory just um, that he felt like he was always outside on the shore and his brothers were sort of in the water together and that eventually um, he found his own family to be in sync with in his um, crew members um, and and that the sort of point of it and the beauty of it is his finding his own ability to sync up and find family wherever he goes um, which is a beautiful lesson to learn in life and take with you to college. Um, got into MIT and is going there. Beautiful, beautiful essay. So the next one is on, uh, you know, the subject of racism and gun violence. I didn't read it last time because I felt like I needed something uplifting, but I'm going to read it today. Um, it raises really important questions, and this one was written differently. The, the writer of this essay, who ended up getting into UC Berkeley, uh, Lauren Kahn, um, had the moment, and she just wanted to write about this moment, and it was a matter of unpacking why it was so important and the complexity of the moment. And you'll hear when you hear the essay just how complex it is. It, it is. Um, and even in light of the present situation um, with racism and, and gun violence and police brutality and what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, not that it's new in the world, only that um, it's the subject of the current protests and it's in the news a lot lately. Um, it's far from new. Um, that these issues come up in this essay and she does a beautiful job, I think, of at least exposing them even if she can't resolve them entirely. So here we go. People are mad, one of my closest friends, Lydia, said to me, because you have never been directly affected by gun violence. It doesn't make sense that you get to lead the walk out. The most common criticism against our gun violence protest was its lack of diversity. Despite weeks focused on outreach, the size and demographics of our group remain the same, mostly white. It's not an issue that involves you. It's not your fight, Lydia went on. And that was the that was the, the the central story she wanted to tell. And then she had to unravel. You know, was it her fight? Did she have a right? And what this raised in her? It's not an issue that involves you. It's not your fight. Lydia went on. My grandmother died from a bullet wound. Remember? 
no sooner were the words out of my mouth that I want, than I wanted to take them back. I was filled with guilt for using my grandmother's death to defend myself. All I knew of her death was that she was shot and killed in Michigan by a man who tried to rob her small furniture store. My father was ten. I never even knew her. Though my grandmother is barely ever mentioned in our household, except once a year when we light a yardside candle in her honor, her lingering memory is plagued by darker connotations of violence and loss. My grandmother's violent death was hard for me to understand, and even harder for my father to discuss. Months after the walkout, I find myself telling a friend how guilty I feel bringing up my grandmother in the context of gun violence. You have the closest connection to gun violence of anyone I know, and I witnessed a double homicide. I never even knew my grandmother. It hurt my dad, but it was too long ago to have any effect on me. But this wasn't true. From a young age, I have desperately tried to understand the loss my father experienced. I watch his eyes well up with tears while the rest of my family gazes at a small flame that, birth, that burns in his mother's honor. I rarely ask him about her death because I don't like the way his voice changes when he talks about her. It is softer and full of sadness. But now, reminded of every feeling that her death has evoked in me, I was forced to admit that indeed I have been affected by her murder and that in turn I have been directly affected by gun violence. My time at Oakland Tech has illuminated the blind spots I have regarding race. It has woken me up to and helped me address my white fragility, and for that I am grateful. But to believe I have not been deeply and personally affected by gun violence is to ignore the death of my grandmother and the unquestionable impact that that loss has had on my family. It is to believe that my background prevents me from being compassionate, open-minded, and a rightful participant in my community. And I refuse to do that. It's got a really strong ending. I mean, I think she was wrestling with um, leading a protest. Um, I think it was a Black Lives Matter protest um, and related to gun violence in Oakland, um, California, and feeling, um, being told she, she had no right to lead this protest, um, feeling herself that uh, guilty about using her grandmother as a defense and then coming to realize that she had a right to have feelings about that had been directly impacted by gun violence and had to do a lot of work. She ended up reading White Fragility, the book White Fragility, um, to understand what her particular relationship um, is and was to racism and, and to gun violence. Um, and then it's a very empowered position at the end, I think, where she says, but to believe I have not been deeply and personally affected by gun violence is to ignore the death of my grandmother and the unquestionable impact that that loss has had on my family. It is to believe that my background prevents me from being compassionate, open-minded, and a rightful participant in my community. And I refuse to do that. So complex topic, and uh, she took it on and and really spoke from her heart and did a lot of work to get to what she got to. So um, these are beautiful essays, and I'm so grateful to be able to read them, share them, speak about the process by which they're written. Of course, there's a whole new group of uh, rising seniors who are writing their essays. I'm going to speak next time I think about the COVID supplement. The Common App, as you know, has introduced the COVID supplement. Um, and that's a really, really interesting opportunity for students to um, kind of track their own relationship to this pandemic and how it's affected them. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for colleges to get a window into the li lives and souls of students uh, via their response to the epidemic. So that's that's uh, that's up next, and um, in the meantime, happy to be healthy and full of energy and ready to um, work and share, and um, always grateful of it.
people are here sharing this moment with me and um, stay well. See you soon.